Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dennis Hendricks from the Department of State Growth, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the Transition Changes for Tasmanian Businesses online information session. Before we commence, and in recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, I would like to acknowledge all Tasmanian Aboriginal people, the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. As you may be aware, the Public Health Emergency Declaration declared under the Public Health Act 1997 is expected to end 30th of June 2022, after first being declared 17th of March 2020. In this information session, you'll hear directly from Dr Mark Beach, Director of Public Health, who will be joined by Jenny Calder, Senior, Pol Senior Policy Analyst at Emergency Management Public Health Services, and Robin Pearce, Executive Director, WorkSafe Tasmania. Our guest presenters will provide an overview of the incoming changes and provide some insights into what businesses need to do to manage the ongoing risks of COVID-19 in the workplace. During the sessions, if you could please write any questions that you have by the question and answer icon in the top right hand corner of your screen, we'll then circle back to those at the end of the presentations. Please note that the session is being recorded and it will be published on the Business Tasmania website. This is to ensure that businesses that are unable to attend can still access this information. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first presenter, Dr. March Beach, the Director of Public Health. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, and, um, and thank you everybody for joining this session. Um, what I thought I would do by way of introduction and to get to the changes that are occurring over the coming uh, week or so um, is to provide a, uh, a quick flyby of all of the uh, of our experience of COVID to date that's brought us up to where we are today. I know that for some people who are participating, the story and the explanation is very familiar, but I'm also aware that there'll be some people um, on this um, webinar who uh, may be less familiar with uh, what's happened, when and why. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but just a very high level scene setting. Then I'll talk a little bit about um, what's going to change from a public health perspective um, uh, over the coming week. Um, and then uh, I will will um, I'll, I'll stop and Robin will will take up the story uh, from a work safe uh, perspective um, about what's uh, remaining the same, what's changing your obligations and so on. So um, as as Dennis mentioned, um, there was a public health emergency declared back in March 2020, around about the same time as there was a, a state of emergency declared by the, the Premier uh, on the advice of the, um, uh, the, the police commissioner. Um, uh, and that was because we were facing a, a, an unknown threat from um, COVID. This uh, viral infection was emerging in many countries overseas and had been in the first few cases were occurring in Australia. Um, and we were operating in uh, with very little lim limited information about how easily this spread, what the consequences of the illness would be. Um, we didn't have a vaccine. Um, most of our pandemic planning had been based around influenza and we didn't know how different COVID was from influenza. Um, we chose the influenza response model uh, to, a, to a substantial extent, uh, but as we understood COVID better and its differences from influenza, we adapted and changed our uh, approach. Uh, a lot of the guidance that um, uh, was provided by um, uh, various national agencies uh, were implemented in Tasmania uh, because we tried for the most part to have a uh, nationally consistent approach to to managing COVID. States diverged at times and had slightly different approaches, um, but the principles they applied to management were uh, broadly similar. Some states obviously had uh, greater challenges as they went along, um, but I think it's fair to say that as we move into the middle of 2020, uh, most of the states of Australia are, are in roughly the same sort of COVID boat. So if we go back to the very start, um, Tasmania had the um, initial experience of uh, 
uh, cases being introduced from uh, a cruise ship that docked with a large number of uh, infected passengers um, and that initiated an outbreak in the northwest of the state that resulted in I think around 130 cases uh, and unfortunately 13 deaths. Um, also through the course of 2020 um, there were another um, 100 or so cases uh, of people who came into the state often from overseas or interstate um, were diagnosed but didn't spread the disease or initiate a large outbreak. Uh, and the reason why that probably didn't happen uh, is because we had uh, quite restrictive uh, measures in place around uh, movement and mixing uh, and good pickup of cases that meant that we contained that first wave of infection from the original uh, virus that caused uh, COVID um, without extensive spread into the community, with the exception of the experience on the northeast. Um, there was then, from the point of view of COVID, um, disease in, in Tasmania, a long quiet period uh, really between the um, uh, middle of 2020 through to late 2021 um, when we maintained border restrictions uh, and the border restrictions were uh, empowered by the um, Emergency Management Act and the um, Deputy State Controller, um, but there were complementary public health uh, restrictions also in place. Um, and we were very fortunate that we had um, very few incursions of COVID into Tasmania in the course of, of 2021. Uh, and by contrast, people can, can uh, consider the awful experience that New South Wales and Victoria had uh, with their large waves of uh, both the original infection and the Delta strain of the, of the virus uh, during 2020-21. Um, that was a, 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 a strain of the virus that had a higher case fatality rate than, than the, the strain of it that we would subsequently come to face in Tasmania. So our border measures in particular um, kept COVID at bay or out of Tasmania uh, very substantially up until we uh, moved on to um, until late 2021. Um, by that stage, we had uh, vaccines. Um, the government took the decision to ensure that um, everybody who was eligible for a vaccine would have an opportunity to receive the vaccine before the borders were opened and we admitted risk. Um, and furthermore, we pushed very hard to, to have a high level of vaccination amongst eligible people. Um, there'd been initial considerations that we should start to relax measures when we got 70% of the population vaccinated, uh, but we took the view that we would aim for 90% of the population vaccinated before we um, enabled risk to enter. And it, it, even though it might not seem such a big jump to go from 70 to 90%, uh, what that really means is you're going from 30% unvaccinated people to 10% unvaccinated people. Um, so you actually reduce the pool of, uh, of remaining unvaccinated people very substantially. And I think that was, um, I'm very glad the government supported that advice um, by holding the borders shut until we achieved a high level of vaccination and particularly a high level of vaccination amongst vulnerable people such as people in, in residential aged care. Um, so then um, with a lot of, um, with most of the population, eligible population vaccinated, um, with long standing in measures in place to uh, be able to manage cases of COVID if, as they occurred as individual cases or as outbreaks. Um, and with uh, a lot of work over the over the year or so with various agencies to be ready to, to handle cases of COVID if they occurred in their midst. We opened the borders uh, on the 15th of December of last year um, and fairly soon after the borders opened, uh, we started to see cases of COVID in Tasmania. What we saw was an outbreak that was due to um, what was called the Omicron strain of uh, the virus that causes COVID. And that Omicron strain um, was more infectious than the earlier strains of, of COVID that we'd seen, so it spreads more easily. But fortunately, it was um, less virulent or less harmful. It still could certainly cause people to die, uh, particularly vulnerable people, but it didn't seem to have quite the same propensity to do that as the earlier strains were doing. So we were dealing with a strain that was spread more easily, but per infection caused less harm. And what then occurred over the um, 
in early January is we had a first wave of one kind of the Omicron variant, strain, uh, the original strain of it, that began to subside um, in um, April or in uh, March. <coughs> but then during April of this year, a new strain of the Omicron came along, the BA2 strain, and that was even more easily uh, spread, not similar sort of um, virulence or harmfulness as the uh, original Omicron strain, but it spread more easily in the population. And that's the strain of infection that we all know someone, we've all probably got someone in our household um, who's had that infection. So between uh, between um, March of, of this year through April, um, and then continuing really until the last few weeks, we've had um, uh, relatively high, but then slowly subsiding levels of Omicron BA2 infection in the Tasmanian community. Um, people have been, uh, for the most part, protected against severe outcomes from that infection, typically because of being vaccinated. Um, but unfortunately, um, uh, around about 60 people have died of, of, um, of coronavirus in the course of that wave. Um, and even though I said that, that it was less virulent or harmful in the earlier strains, the sheer number of cases that occurred uh, is what's unfortunately resulted in a, a moderate number of deaths. Um, so that's kind of where we got to a couple of weeks ago. Um, and by that stage, roughly a third of the Tasmanian population uh, had been diagnosed and notified with COVID um, this year. Um, and if we assume that not everybody who gets uh, infected gets tested or gets notified, I think it's fair to say that probably half of the Tasmanian population will have had COVID uh, this year. And I I'm guessing that will probably equate with uh, your experience. Um, what we started, what we were seeing over the last two or three weeks was uh, a kind of a low a plateauing of cases at around about uh, five or six hundred a day, which was about as low as the case numbers had been since um, around February this year. Um, we didn't know how long case numbers would stay low um, because we knew there was a new strain of the Omicron virus, what's called the BA5 strain and also the BA4 strain. Um, they're also a little bit more infectious than the last strain we've experienced, but not, um, it seems, more um, serious causes of, of more likely to cause severe illness. They've got a similar severity, but they just spread that a little bit easier. Um, and the thing about viruses is they only have to spread a little bit more easily uh, to become the predominant strain. Uh, and if part of the reason why they spread so easily is that they escape those parts of your immune response that protect you from getting infected in the first place, um, they can spread in a vaccinated population. Um, people will be aware that we've reported slightly higher numbers of cases occurring in the last um, 10 or so days. And I think that's very likely to reflect um, the increasing numbers of these BA5 uh, and BA4 strains of the Omicron virus. And I think what that's going to mean in practice is we're going to see cases in the thousands or over a thousand uh, for a little while yet. Um, how high the case numbers will go, I, I, I'm not sure. I'd be a little surprised if we saw the very high case numbers that we saw so disruptively during um, um, April uh, or March and April of this year, um, but I think it's not going away. We're going to see substantial numbers of cases continuing in the community uh, for the weeks to come. And that's accentuated a bit by the fact that it's winter. Um, in winter, we tend to spend more time indoors, at home, uh, and in settings where viruses spread um, fairly readily. Um, so I think by way of setting the scene, um, even though we're coming to the end of the public health emergency, and I'll just go on to that very shortly, uh, I think it's important to, to grasp that it's not the end of COVID um, and that we will need to have plans in place to uh, proportionately manage uh, COVID in our various workplaces and in our lives, um, all through winter at least. Um, and um, if we have less COVID next year, that would be great, but I don't think anybody can actually predict that yet. So what we've done over the last few weeks, um, or really over the last year or two, is set up um, mechanisms um, through, through health, 
um, public health through liaison with uh, settings such as aged care, uh, the disability sector um, and schools and so on to be able to get by um, with COVID in our community when it came as it has. Um, and of course, that's been a very important part of the, uh, the business community's response. Um, and while not directly challenged very often by COVID until December this year, I'm sure you've all been managing it in your own workplaces um, um, since then. Um, what's going to change now with the end of a public health emergency? Well, the public health emergency, as Dennis mentioned, um, was declared back in, in March, um, and it was declared so that we could use what I might call the more vigorous powers accorded to the Director of Public Health to manage the risk over the time since then. So that in included the powers to uh, do some pretty disruptive things, such as to, to um, uh, have requirements, you know, lock down communities and parts of the states for a time, uh, various requirements about masks and, um, um, and vaccines, um, uh, there was a, a direction that also placed requirements on businesses to have a COVID plan uh, in conjunction with existing requirements of businesses uh, through their occupational health and safety obligations and a whole lot of restrictions on the density in various places. And most of these things we've actually wound back uh, because we've felt that, we, that, that our circumstances and our ability to manage COVID have been sufficient that we haven't needed to maintain many of those measures and there's not an awful lot left. Um, what will, um, there are a couple of things that won't change and I think it's important to mention them because I think um, uh, I, I would hope they provide some reassurance uh, and the, the, the one thing that won't change uh, at least for the short to medium term um, is that we will still require cases to isolate for seven days. So someone gets diagnosed with COVID, um, they'll, they will be notified by the laboratory it's, if it's a laboratory diagnosis. Um, if they've made the diagnosis themselves using a rat test, um, they're required to register that rat test with public health uh, and they're required essentially to isolate for seven days. That's not actually, that's not going to change. Um, cases, uh, uh, contract contacts of cases and those contacts are mostly people in households the requirements of, requirements of them will also stay the same. Um, uh, they've changed in the last few weeks so that contacts are enabled to leave home um, during their period, uh, seven days of period as a contact, providing they uh, test negative before they leave home. Um, that requirement of, of case of contacts to test negative before leaving home uh, for any purpose, including work, will continue. Uh, there will be a requirement of context to advise their employer um, that they are a contact and for how long they remain a contact. Um, and then the employer uh, will be in the position to make a decision about whether to accept them at work during their period of uh, close contact, uh, being a close contact and whether they put additional requirements around them. Uh, it's worth noting that any contact that leaves home must be wearing a mask. So, that, so at the very least, they'll be wearing a mask and not have symptoms. Um, so those those requirements won't change. Uh, the uh, the legislative basis of those requirements does change. So rather than it being a requirement of a direction under the emergency provisions of the Public Health Act, um, the requirements of cases and contacts uh, will be um, empowered by a order under Section 53 of the Public Health Act, but that's not really something that's going to be visible to uh, cases and contacts. Um, we still want um, individuals um, to be uh, adopting COVID safe behaviours that, that, that I hope have that become pretty familiar over the last um, two years. We want them to get vaccinated, boosted, to get a winter dose if they're eligible. Um, we want them to stay home if they're sick with respiratory tract symptoms. And I think if there's one lasting legacy of, um, of COVID, I hope that it's uh, a bit of a change from the practice of present presenteeism of people so that people rather than um, soldiering on like the old codril ad um, with respiratory tract infection symptoms and spreading their infection at work, um, we want them to stay home until they've 
uh, substantially recovered. And obviously it's important that businesses uh, are also supportive of people adopting those responsible practices because it's in their best interest too. Um, even if people test negative for COVID, they could have flu or other respiratory symptom infections that could um, take out part of a small workforce. Um, we want people to continue to get tested, particularly if they're at risk of the more serious complications of COVID or, or flu for that matter, uh, and uh, and to know that there are treatments for people who are who are more prone to get complications of COVID or flu that can reduce their likelihood of needing to get into to um, needing to be hospitalised or even dying. Um, but you can't get treated unless you get diagnosed. So it's really important to um, to get um, tested if you've got symptoms. Uh, and we want people to be comfortable wearing a mask when they choose to. Uh, even though we may remove uh, masks from a range of settings where there's no longer a uh, mandate under public health law for people to wear a mask, we want them to feel comfortable to wear a mask and to do so, um, if particularly if they're in a setting which is crowded, they can't socially distance readily, uh, or they simply just want to wear a mask. We really need to make the wearing of masks quite socially uh, acceptable. And also we want people to understand that uh, when the public health mandates for mask wearing are removed, um, businesses may still make a decision um, based on the work that they do, their clients, their business continuity needs, um, um, and the community COVID risk, businesses may still make a decision that they want staff or, um, or clients or patrons to wear a mask. So we want people to be, um, uh, ready to accept such requirements should a business um, require it. Now, um, people will know that when we went in talking about masks that last week we removed the um, requirement for people to wear uh, masks. Just at a mental blank, where did we where did we remove that from? Um, what do you think uh, last Friday night airports airport. Remember? Airports. I came through the airport last Friday night. Um, so we were all one of the last people to wear a mask compulsorily. Um, so yes, last Thursday, in concert with the rest of Australia, we 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 removed the requirement to wear masks in airports. Uh, people are still required to wear masks on um, domestic and international flights uh, in and around Australia, and and again that won't be removed until there's a nationally agreed approach to it. Um, this Friday night, the requirement to wear masks in um, schools, uh, childcare uh, and public transport, including TT line, will be removed as a public health order. Um, and the following Thursday night into Friday morning, uh, the, the last remaining public health mandated mask wearing requirements in hospitals, residential aged care, uh, residential disability care uh, and other Healthcare settings will be uh, will be removed. Um, now I know that um, public health and WorkSafe have been working with uh, the business sector over many weeks uh, about um, a range of measures in place to to mitigate the risk of COVID in the absence of public health mandates. Uh, and masks are obviously uh, an important one of those to turn turn one's mind to. Um, the last thing I'll just briefly mention are vaccination mandates. Um, the, there are remaining public health mandates for people to be um, uh, to have at least their first two doses of, of COVID vaccine that apply to hospitals, um, what we call high street healthcare, so the sort of private healthcare uh, around the community, residential aged care facilities, disability, residential services, um, and um, the carers and teachers in in, in childcare, um, and those public health mandates were in, put in place, um, most of them a year or so ago, uh, at a time when we had much lower population vaccination coverage, uh, and they were put in place to ensure early high vaccination coverage in those settings where uh, there were more vulnerable people. Um, and I think it's fair to say it's done the job uh, because there's been a, a very high uptake across the community, including in those um, in those particular settings. Um, however, organisations and businesses still need to consider the role of vaccination as part of their COVID uh, safety plan. 
Um, but in doing so, it's important they consider it in the context of all the other measures that they will have in place to manage uh, COVID in their workplace, matters of hygiene, um, strong encouragement, as I mentioned earlier, not to turn up to work when you've got respiratory symptoms or you're sick, um, uh, workplace configuration that, that enables uh, some degree of social distancing, good ventilation, mask wearing either as a voluntary or a measure or requirements. Um, and it's important, I think, that workplaces do what they can to promote vaccination of their staff. Uh, and they could do things such as ensure that staff have got leave to go and get go out and get a dose of vaccine. Um, they can recognise that a small number of people may feel a bit crook for a day or so after having a dose of vaccine and make sure that workers are, are able to take such leave as they need to recover. Um, so all of those measures will, will maximise the uptake of, of vaccination in a workplace. And then beyond that, it's up to a workplace to consider whether the risk posed to them uh, with all of those measures in place is such that it's necessary to take further steps such as uh, mandating uh, uh, vaccination. I think I should mention that, that it's important to understand what vaccinations can achieve um, and because not everybody distinguishes these two features of, of how a vaccine works or the, out, the, the kind of um, outcomes or the, or the benefits of vaccination. Um, it's very clear that um, COVID vaccinations provide protection against severe illness, uh, including hospitalisation and death from COVID. Um, and that's, uh, you get a substantial benefit from two doses of, of um, vaccine against um, hospitalisation and death from COVID. That benefit is greater uh, for older people because they're intrinsically more at risk of experiencing those complications. Um, getting your booster dose of vaccine uh, provides an, an important boost to your vaccination and prolongation of your protection. Um, and for people who, particularly people who are older with vulnerabilities, that fourth dose, the winter dose, also provides a little bit of extra protection, perhaps less, less extra protection for, for younger people, um, but more protection for older people. So it's clear that vaccination, the evidence is very solid, and we can see it in the Tasmanian experience, that vaccine prevents the recipients from getting um, serious illness and death. It doesn't protect it for absolutely everybody, but it certainly substantially reduces the likelihood at a population level. Um, what vaccines have less effect effectiveness at is uh, preventing infection uh, and transmission. Um, and I think the experience we've had in the last um, six months is where a lot of the infections have been spread between vaccinated people um, is kind of the, the most obvious evidence of the limited protective value that vaccines provide against infection. Um, however, um, they still do probably, uh, for a few weeks after receiving them, reduce the likelihood that someone um, can spread a catch and spread infection. Um, but that particular outcome of vaccination is relatively short lived. Um, and that's why it's very important that when considering your control measures, that you look at the whole package and don't put all your eggs in the, um, the vaccination basket if what you're trying to do is prevent transmission at the workplace. Um, so I might just pause or even stop now. Um, and um, I think the format we're going to use is we'll, we'll pass to Robin, I think. Is that the way we, we're going, Dennis? And we'll take questions later. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Veach. That'd be, that, that's great. And, uh, Robin, over to you. Thanks a lot, um, Dennis, and thanks, Mark, for setting the scene about how we've got to this point in time, the changes that can be expected in the near future, as well as that summary of the range of desired controls to have in place while we keep managing COVID in the Tasmanian community. So as Mark indicated, what I'm going to be discussing with you is the obligations that businesses have going forward, um, what a COVID risk assessment means, and the support that remains available to businesses. So, as Mark said, we do need to keep managing COVID carefully in Tasmanian community and workplaces. So from a work health and safety perspective, businesses have always had an obligation to mitigate the risk of COVID transmission in the workplace, so far as reasonably practicable. And that's the context of our work health and safety laws. They are risk-based 
and it's putting in place those measures that are practicable to put into place. This obligation arises because workplaces have a duty to ensure the health and safety of workers and others in their workplaces. Um, and COVID and other respiratory infections such as flu are able to be transmitted in workplaces because of the way in which work is carried out. And it is something which workplaces are able to put measures in to reduce the likelihood of the, the virus being transmitted, as well as the amount of harm that it can cause. So a business's responsibility to manage the risk of COVID will continue after the public health emergency ends because it's still here. It still is a risk to the health and safety of workers and other people who come into your workplace. But from a practical perspective, not much will really change. You know, over the last two years, businesses have been meeting their work health and safety obligations by following a combination of those things that have been mandated under public health directions, as well as through their work health and safety duties, through the risk assessments that they've done and the COVID safety plans that have been put in place. Those measures have been making sure that businesses have uh, reduced the risk so far as reasonably practicable. And I just want to unpack a little bit what that term means, reasonably practicable. You know, a business will meet that requirement if they have considered what the likelihood is of COVID transmission happening in the workplace, the degree of harm that might come about from COVID transmission in the workplace and what the business knows or ought reasonably know about the ways that you can reduce the risk of transmission. Um, it's also impacted by the availability and suitability of different ways to, to minimise the risk. And after you've considered all of those factors, what the cost is that's associated with um, putting in place those risks, those measures, but only if that cost is grossly disproportionate to the risk. So to date, you've been required to follow public health directions and those public health directions have provided information from a work health and safety duties perspective on what businesses ought to know and the suitable ways to minimise the risk. So that's ticked off on two of the elements of what's reasonably practicable. And because they've been in public health mandates to a large degree, you've been required to put those things into place. The other parts of what's reasonably practicable have been addressed when the business has done an assessment of the likelihood of transmission in the workplace and the degree of harm that might result from the transmission. And that's a part of a standard risk assessment process um, and a lot of businesses have done that risk assessment, determined the controls to put in place and documented their approach in a COVID safety plan. Now, those controls, some have been determined by public health directions such as distance, distancing, density, cleaning, cleaning and hygiene regimes, having signage in place. Others have been determined by some businesses. So some businesses who have decided to mandate vaccination where they weren't otherwise required to. Some businesses have decided to put in Persepex barriers where they may not have been required to do that. So there's always been an element of uh, public health direction determining the actions to take place and businesses determining as well the other measures are put in place to mitigate the risk. This risk assessment process, and I really want to emphasise this, and making decisions on control measures is no different to the way that businesses have always managed their other work health and safety risks. As a routine part of doing business, you consider the risk speed of a manual handling, slips, trips and falls, assess the likelihood and harm that might come from it, determine the controls, the business makes the decision and puts them in place. And I make those decisions considering what expert knowledge is about out there, what industry bodies might say about good ways of going about mitigating particular risks. So with the end of the public health emergency, the key change is that the information that a business should know about COVID and the ways to minimise the risk of transmission won't be in public health directions. It won't be mandated. Instead, it's going to be in best practice guidelines that will be issued by public health. 
So when it comes to starting to consider what controls to put in place, there will remain a source of expert knowledge for you to refer to on what are the best ways to mitigate the risks. You just need to make the decisions about which one that you, ones that you put in place and how to go about putting them in place. Undoubtedly, industry bodies provide significant guidance in that, that space as well. And as Mark's already talked about, it's important to think about this as being a, um, a suite of measures that are put in place. And if you look really closely at those public health measures that were mandated in the uh, public health directions on workplace COVID plans, many of them already directly reflect your duties under the Work Health and Safety Act. So for example, the requirement for cleaning and hygiene is consistent with the requirement to provide a safe working environment. The requirement for signage, supervision and training is consistent with your duty to provide information, training and supervision under the Act. And the requirement for a COVID safety plan is really consistent with the duty to provide a safe system of work. So we need to remember that the end of the public health emergency doesn't mean a significant change for most businesses. If you have already assessed the risk of COVID transmission in the workplace, in consultation with your workers, if you've implemented the controls, got a system for ensuring the controls can be maintained, um, such as documenting them in a COVID safety plan, you don't need to do anything further unless something has changed since you last reviewed your risk assessment and controls. So things that might have changed could include um, whether you have vulnerable people in your workplace and you may not have done previously, or whether you've previously manda mandated vaccination and the level of vaccination in the community prompts you to review whether this control is still appropriate for, for your circumstances. But if you haven't done a risk assessment, and you haven't implemented controls and you haven't documented your system, then you're required to do the risk assessment under the Work Health and Safety Act. That is absolutely a duty that you have um, and you're required to implement controls and to make sure you've got a system to manage the controls. And we suggest and continue to suggest that that's a, a really good way of doing that is through a documented COVID safety plan. So I've talked a bit about risk assessments um, and how do you go about doing a risk assessment? Well, if you go to the WorkSafe website, we have guidance materials and templates available there that will assist you to do a COVID risk assessment. And those guidance materials will work, walk you through how to, you know, firstly, make sure that you put in place a process that makes sure you're consulting with your workers throughout the risk assessment process um, and in the implementation of your controls. Consultation is an absolutely key factor um, and you may have seen media some months ago about one business on the mainland who decided to mandate vaccination and they'd made that decision without consultation um, and that decision got reversed, not because of the decision itself, because of, but because of the process that's been used. Um, so if you've got a process for consulting with your workers, then consider the likelihood of COVID being transmitted in your workplace if you don't have any controls in place. So if you don't have any signage or cleaning processes or hygiene solutions available, then think about, you know, what are the ways that COVID can come into your workplace and how can it be spread from person to person? And once you've considered those factors, then think about, you know, what are the consequences or the impact of COVID being transmitted in the workplace? So thinking about things like how would it affect your workers? How might it affect your customers and the way that you go about um, providing your services? How might it affect your contractors and visitors? And importantly, what's the potential impact on the continuity of your business? Once you've assessed the likelihood and the consequence of COVID transmission, if there are no controls in place, um, you'll determine then whether the risk in each situation is high, moderate or low. And this helps you to focus on what areas um, the risk is greatest in and where you want to look at focusing your controls. So then we turn to what's known about COVID and the ways to control the risk. And this is where the public health best practice guidelines will really come to the fore, as well as other industry information. And it's certainly that information that um, WorkSafe Tasmania relies on when we provide advice to business on how to go about um, 
uh, mitigating their risks, as well as when we do compliance inspections to look at what is reasonably practi practicable because it comes back to what's known or ought to be known. So look at that information, determine which controls are most suited to your business context and think about whether the controls that you choose are going to reduce the likelihood and consequence to an acceptable level. Then write these down in a COVID safety plan so it's easy for your staff to see, use that to train, provide information to your existing staff as well as to induct new staff and continue the training. You can also use that information to make sure that you're advising customers and visitors to your workplace on what your requirements are of them that you've decided to reduce your risk. Then the other important thing is to review it if circumstances change. Don't just sit it on a shelf and not look at it again. Think about as circumstances change, whether your clientele change, the, you have vulnerable workers that commence in your workplace, or even when you're looking at potentially moving from winter to spring when the risk of spread reduces or you know summer through autumn to winter when again COVID transmission the risk is likely to increase again they're good times to pull out your COVID safety plan and review your controls and look at what you want to change in the workplace. So have a look at our website for advice um, on how to do a risk assessment and do contact us if you want support. I want to add at this point that, you know, we often hear concerns about um, businesses fearing they're going to be liable if there is an outbreak in the workplace because they don't have suitable controls in place. Um, and I guess there's a couple of dimensions to that concern. Um, firstly, there's you know liability down to work health and safety laws. Um, there's liability down to workers' compensation legislation. And then, of course, there's the common law. Um, that's a matter for the courts and the tort of negligence, and I'm not going to go into that space because that's not the work health and safety space. But I do want to look at work health and safety and workers' compensation. Um, and you know, prima facie, if if a business has got effective controls in place, it's going to be less likely to be, be found to have breached work health and safety laws if there's a COVID-19 outbreak in your workplace. Um, you know, if an inspector finds that you aren't complying with work health and safety laws, so that is that you're not mitigating the risk so far as reasonably practicable, an inspector may issue you with an improvement notice. Um, and that improvement notice will give you um, direction on going back and most likely reviewing your system and improving the controls that you've got in place. If you fail to comply with that notice and satisfy the, the inspector that you've said that you've met the requirements, you can be fined $3,600. But to give that some context, throughout the last two years of the pandemic, we've done over 6,000 workplace inspections. Of those 6,000, we've issued 88 improvement notices. So that gives you some context that the vast majority of businesses are meeting their requirements and doing it well. And from those 88 improvement notices, we've issued one infringement notice. So only one business has not complied with an improvement notice. So the risk of being liable is pretty low. Having said that, the best protection, and it's in your best interest to make sure you have got the controls in place. And that's fundamentally, if you want to keep your business operating and keep business continuity, you need healthy workers at work. We're getting really used to the suite of controls that are there for COVID. Having them in place is your best bet to keeping your business operating and keeping your workers healthy and safe at work. And then you don't have any issues to worry about when it comes to liability. In terms of workers' compensation, um, so the workers' compensation scheme in Tasmania, it's, it's a no-fault scheme. So if a worker contracts COVID-19 um, and their employment has been the major or most significant factor in them contracting the illness, the worker is entitled to make a claim for workers' compensation. Now, um, there has to date within the Tasmanian scheme been 73 claims for workers' compensation lodged. The vast majority of those, so probably about um, two thirds of those were lodged when 
COVID was not being spread throughout community. It's when there were specific outbreaks and most of them associated with that initial outbreak mark described on the northwest coast. Um, the other part of it is that where those claims have been lodged, the vast majority of those have been accepted by insurers, which is a really positive sign because it means that the workers' compensation process is working well. Um, and the transmissibility within workplaces where it's legitimate is being recognised by insurers. So then I mentioned before to contact us for support and I did want to touch on um, just what the forms of support are that are available. So over the last two years, WorkSafe has provided COVID advice and information on nearly 10,000 occasions throughout the emergency. Most of those to, are to businesses, but also to workers and members of the public. We've done this through inquiries to our helpline, through visits from our advisory service and safe farming teams to workplaces, um, attending forums, presentations, sharing information, and those 6,000 compliance inspections I mentioned before. These services and activities will be continuing so that we can keep supporting businesses and make sure that businesses have a good picture of what good COVID compliance with work health and safety laws looks like. In addition to that, um, advice and information is also available through the TCCI Work Health and Safety Service, um, and that's available whether or not businesses are a member of the TCCI or not. It's a service that's, that's funded by the Work Cover Tasmania Board. And um, there's also advice and support is always available from Business um, Tasmania, who I know take um, a lot of requests for advice and assistance and help businesses find the, the right part of government to help them with their queries. So Dennis, I think that that's it from me at this point, but look forward to moving into the question time component. Fantastic. Um, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Beach, Jenny and Robin. Uh, to, for that really helpful information. Uh, to, I think there's some really useful information there. We're just going to go and um, we've had quite a few questions from the audience. Um, I will remind people just if you do have a question, just use the question and answer tab at the top on the right hand corner. Um, write it down and we'll be happy to sort of push that forward to the panel. So I might start off, um, the first one is somebody that's very interested in getting some specific advice in relation to accommodation providers that have shared facilities and co-shared dorm rooms. Now, um, I suppose there's two parts to that question. One is whether there's anything that anybody would like to say specifically in relation to that, but also is there information available for specific sectors uh, to, or industry types? I mean, I'm happy to just note perhaps the that it's a it's a really useful question because we know that um, dormitory accommodation um, uh, seasonal workers comes to come to mind um, uh, poses a risk of transmission when there's COVID around. Um, so it it certainly does identify a a high risk setting. Um, and I'm just racking my brains to think about whether there's any specific public health guidance on that. Um, I'm not sure that we have produced any particular document, so I might actually see whether Robin or Jenny can 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 pop in. Hi, uh, Jenny. Yeah, thanks, Dennis, and thanks, Mark. Um, I believe there was previous and still existing outbreak outbreak management framework information that. Um, these kinds of businesses or residential accommodation um, type places like where you might have seasonal workers um, can access and that so an outbreak management framework is still a useful document that businesses might want to have in place. Um, however, in terms of the new suite of documents that we're producing, there's not a specific one targeted at that sector. Um, please refer to the general workplaces one that we'll be publishing. Uh, and um, I would also add in that regard um, as well, Jenny, that, um, you know, it's a matter of the business breaking down the risk assessment in this process and thinking through the steps of how is COVID likely to be spread um, and what is the ways in which that can happen. Now, if there is a risk of spread because there is shared accommodation, 
well, what are the ways that you might want to think about mitigating that? And if there's not able to be um, distancing, if the ventilation is, you know, middle of winter may not be able to occur as much as you'd like, then, you know, thinking about things like requiring face masks is an appropriate measure to, to think through. So break down how can it spread in my workplace in a shared environment and what are the ways that we can look at mitigating it. Um, and then you can set those requirements on people that are coming into those spaces, particularly if you are getting people who are not, you know, family groups to share different people coming together to share the accommodation. It can be one of your conditions of use of the accommodation. As long as you communicate that up front, that these are the conditions of coming in and using this particular facility. Thank you. But, uh, I'll move on to, so the next one is about risk assessments and I believe this has been covered sort of, but, but it might, we may be able to elaborate a little bit and it's really just from somebody who really is a bit unsure about how to conduct a risk assessment, um, where can they go for help and, and can they get somebody to actually come to them uh, to on their workplace to give them a hand? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, depending upon the industry sector, Dennis. Um, yeah. If they are in the um, agriculture industry, our Safe Farming Tasmania advisors um, come to site and provide advice and support. If they're in within general industry, so any other sector, mm -hmm. then please contact the Work um, Safe Tasmania helpline, uh, request an advisor, um, and we provide a free advisory service to small to medium businesses to assist them with um, the management of their work health and safety risks. And they will support them um, and provide advice on the steps to put in place. Fantastic. Um, next question is um, really, can I still ask my employee for evidence of a negative rat test if they are unwell? So if somebody presents and they're not, then it's clear that they're not feeling well. I mean, I, I, again, I, I'll probably have a bit of a go and then Robin will correct me from good workplace practices. But I, I think my first response would be that we have to think very carefully whether someone should be um, okaying an unwell person returning to their workplace. Um, the person is unwell with a respiratory tract infection um, particularly if it's in the early day or so of their infection, they're probably posing a risk to your workplace. Um, we recommend that people who have respiratory symptoms get tested for COVID. Um, um, and particularly at the moment when flu may well become as common as COVID for a few weeks, um, you know, it may be prudent for them to also be tested from for flu and some of that testing will be happening through state clinics or general practice, but um, obviously the thing that people can do in their bathroom is to do a rat. Um, so if that unwell person uh, comes to work and says, I've got a negative rat, um, the employer may you know, take that at face value, but they probably need to also contemplate whether that unwell person could have something else um, or should stay at home. So at least they have a second negative COVID rat um, and are a bit better. So. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I'm really kind of keen to promote less presenteeism as a legacy of our COVID experience. And um, as Mark indicated, I'm very happy to step in on, on this one as well. Um, so this question, um, I guess, exemplifies for me one of the reasons why it is a really good to do your risk assessment and put your um, COVID controls in place through consultation with your workers because they have then been a part of determining what your approach and strategy is going to be. So if you have designed in as part of your risk assessment that one of the measures that you are going to have in place is to make sure that workers are not coming to work if they are unwell or if they have symptoms and part that policy position is that you're going to assess that by them um, showing you a negative rat and people have been had their opportunity to consult on that and provide feedback on that strategy, then once you've got that in place and it's well communicated to people, there's no reason at all why you are not able to say that this is a 
provision and a condition of employment for you coming to work. If you've got symptoms, demonstrate that you have had a negative rat or, you know, if you've still got symptoms, stay home and show me two negative rats day after day and then you're, you're welcome to come back into work. That is quite a reasonable approach to, to take, but, you know, highly recommended that you put that approach in writing. You make sure that it has been really clearly communicated to um, workers so that they are aware of that measure in advance. Thank you for that. Um, the next query is part comment and, and then a question. So and it, and it comes down to the definition of reasonably practical. Um, so to assess reasonably practical, then public health transmission case and outcome data is needed. Um, is TAS, TAS Health still going to make this data available? Um, I reckon I'm going to ha handle the second half of that and <laughs> Robin will handle the first half. Um, the data on, and, and I'm, this may not be precisely answering the question that's being asked here, um, but um, we publish data on, K, on, on the epidemiology of COVID-19 every week. And it tells you the breakdown of cases where they where they live, their age, um, their outcomes, and so on. There's extensive information there about um, about the epidemiology of COVID, and that'll be maintained uh, in some form as we proceed forward. It's important for public to, the public to see that information. We don't drill down to did someone catch this infection here or there, that's completely unknowable. Um, in fact, it's often very difficult to know where an individual caught their infection if it's outside of their household. And obviously a very large, a substantial proportion of cases occur in the, in the household and you'll often see serial cases. You don't necessarily know where the first case in the household caught their infection, but you know the subsequent ones, there's a fair bet that they caught it from um, brother, sister, father, mother. Um, but we we don't have that more detailed information about the non-household settings of where COVID was acquired. Um, suffice to say that the highest risk setting is probably where you spend the most time and where you mix with people most, uh, where you have the most number of intera interactions with people probably um, are the sort of settings where you're more likely to catch COVID just um, because you're more likely to come across someone with infection. Um, but it's not possible to document um, the range of infections. Uh, I think you have to assume that just about anywhere you go in Tasmania when COVID is relatively common could pose a risk of catching it somewhere. Uh, and look, from, from my perspective, um, yes, the um, in, in assessing the likelihood um, of transmission, having an understanding of the um, prevalence of community transmission is a factor in that um, as much as it is you know understanding the the levels of um, vaccination within workforces and populations um, helps a business to, to form a view about what's the likelihood of it entering the workplace and being transmitted through the workplace but you know there probably is some seasonal rules of thumbs too that we can generally apply around this too which is that you know you're more likely to have more prevalence of transmission through the winter months and less likely through the summer months. But the, the information that, that Mark mentioned um, is obviously valuable, um, uh, detailed information to help to inform decision making. I think it also helps you know how much is around, so you have a bit of a sense of it. And um, I think that to give people a little bit of a rule of thumb, um, at the moment when we're seeing between you know, around about a thousand notified cases today. I, I would say that fits in the the upper end of moderate levels of transmission, um, uh, at, at least. Um, what's a low level of transmission? Um, it's probably having, you know, based on current surveillance practices, fewer than than 250 cases um, uh, a day. Um, but we haven't had that few cases really since COVID started. So we, we haven't experienced low level COVID um, uh, from shortly after opening the borders, but we've certainly gone up into the very, into what you clearly call high levels of COVID um, in early January. And um, 
um, during March, April, April, May, um, but we're now probably uh, down uh, towards the top end of moderate levels. And I think looking at that document to give you a bit of a sense of the community risk, which will also translate in many instances to your uh, workplace, is also helpful to calibrate your um, approach. Thank you for that. The, we've got a couple of questions that sort of uh, are connected around mandates. Um, I mean, firstly, will vaccinations for high risk settings, and we're talking about health and aged care facilities, et cetera, remain mandated under Section 53 of the Public Health Act post 30th June? Or is this something that will then be managed by individual businesses um, through their risk assessments? And I mean, the, the comment is, does that even apply to high risk settings, i.e. hospitals, medical centres and pharmacies? Um, the answer is uh, those settings where vaccination is mandated by a public health direction, um, which includes um, a range, wide range of medical services, hospitals, residential aged care, residential disability care, early childhood, and, and, and I think there's a community care um, group that are also subject to it. Those um, settings, those um, workforces will not be subjected to a public health mandate after the 30th of um, June. Um, however, um, the um, business operator or agency may choose as a result of their uh, risk assessment to mandate vaccination beyond then. And I think it's also important to note that there are a number of agencies and businesses who have uh, put mandates in place that are independent of the uh, public health direction um, and the uh, and I expect that they will, that, you know, the, the decision there is with that the those agencies or businesses as whether they continue them. But that's not a um, uh, that's never been mandated by public health in, in 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 some of those other settings. So it's important to make that distinction so that people don't assume that all mandates are off. But, uh, so I, I might jump to a, another one that's related then just just to clarify. So can I still make my staff be vaccinated in a non healthcare setting and can I legally ask my employees to go home if they seem sick and, and will I have to pay them if they don't have any leave available uh, to buy they might be casuals? I think that possibly feels more like one for Robin. Thanks, Mark. Um, yep, I'm happy to take that one. So um, can you still require your staff to be vaccinated? Um, I'll come back to um, the do the risk assessment for your context and consider what the risks are in your context and the advice from the experts from public health about whether or not mandating a vaccination is an appropriate control in that context. Um, so I'm not going to give a clear answer because I don't know the business's context and that's a decision that really needs to be assessed and, and made by the business. Um, whether or not you can legally ask an employee to go home if they seem sick, uh, yes. If a worker has um, the symptoms of COVID-19, then you can ask them to go home. Um, you have a duty as a employer to ensure the health and safety of your workers and other workers. And the worker themselves also has a duty to make sure that their acts and omissions do not have an impact on a negative impact on the health and safety of other persons within the workplace. So not only do you as an employer have that duty, so does the worker themselves. Um, as to whether or not those workers then need payment, uh, are required to be paid. That is really going to be a matter of industrial law. It's going to depend upon the instruments that you have in place. Um, and that would need to be something that if you are unsure about it, then to discuss that with your um, legal advisors or, or human resources advisors, it would, depending on the context. Typically, casual workers do not have sick leave, so if they're engaged um, on a case by case basis for, for each individual engagement. Um, if they're not able to work, um, they don't get paid um, generally, but you might want to consider, um, you know, 
how that then affects your workplace. As Mark said earlier, we do they are unwell and you want to be maintaining a healthy organisational culture as well. Obviously, capacity to pay comes into all of those discussions, so that really is a, is a business matter to determine. That That's a perfect lead into the next question, which is um, essentially what, what support mechanisms will be in place for businesses that do experience legal or industrial relations issues relating to implementing risk mi mitigation strategies? Uh, and there's a couple of examples, i.e. making staff get vaccinated or wearing masks. So again, it sort of goes back to just the, what support mechanisms are available to answer some of those questions. Um. So in terms of answering legal questions and supporting businesses to argue a case for or against something, um, that is not something we as a, as a regulator do. Yep. Um, we will assist businesses to resolve work health and safety issues if an issue has been raised within a workplace, um, usually by a health and safety rep, but if there is a work health and safety issue raised um, and a complaint is made about unsafe work um, conditions, then we do, if our resources allow, um, assist parties to resolve those issues. Um, whether or not there are other mechanisms available outside of work health and safety um, is is another matter, quite frankly. Um, it's not something that we're, we're able to, to provide comment on those other supports. Yep. Um, so the next question is a business that deals with vulnerable population groups and they're, they're um, interested in where they can go to get expert advice regarding infection risks and associate mitigation measure, measures. At, uh, um, so probably looking for some quite specific advice. Um, Jenny. Thanks, Dennis. Um, without knowing more about the specifics, I'm going to assume it's either working with people with a disability or people in residential aged care or a similar community type setting. Um, there are many good links at both the state and federal level. For example, the NDIS um, has published a Quality and Safety Commission fact sheet um, that gives some very useful information in this regard. And then at a Tasmanian level, we have the Tasmanian Infection Prevention and Control Unit resources available on the web. If there's some way we can follow up after this um, forum, maybe Dennis, we could provide some of those links. And then in addition, the um, public health fact sheets that we've been working on over the last couple of weeks and will be soon made available include disability settings, aged care settings, and I think homelessness support services settings. So there's a range of vulnerable groups that are actually addressed um, in those guidances. That's awesome. Um, the next question relates to early childhood learning settings. Um, and uh, the comment is that at the moment, if a child has symptoms, uh, to, they generally can't attend. Um, then as most people know, small kids have runny noses and morning coughs that often disappear by mid-morning. Um, will this requirement change after this setting changes? Um, good question, Dennis. Common question and a difficult question. <laughs> um, and we have been working in the in the suite of, of um, fact sheets that Jenny described as being prepared. We have been working with some wording um, that strikes the right balance between um, not having potentially infectious people in schools and early childhood settings, um, um, but on the other hand, not excluding kids who uh, have transient symptoms or symptoms due to something like hay fever or have had something going on but are very substantially better and might just have the tail end of an illness lingering. So we're trying to get some wording out there that will be a bit more um, strike the right balance between exclusion and attendance in those settings. Um, it's always important also to make sure that if there's flu and COVID around that one of the first things that people do with new infections or significant inf uh, new symptoms or significant infections is to do the test. Thank you. Um, one question is, will PCR testing still be available? Um, um, yes, there's no uh, plan to reduce uh, PCR testing and, and it'll be done through a range of settings. It'll be done through state run uh, testing sites that will be available through respiratory clinics, private practice and the like. Um, and we particularly encourage people who are older or more vulnerable to uh, 
um, severe COVID to get a PCR test. Um, and it's one of the avenues through to um, early treatment of those uh, infections. So uh, PCR testing is still available. Um, you know, the healthy young worker, perhaps, um, in many instances, is just as well to, to, come, to do a rat test, um, but um, PCR testing will remain available. Thank you. Um, and, and we've got one last question, <laughs> at least at the moment, and, um, and it's a point of clarification. So, are, uh, and, and it's just asking, can I clarify, are early childhood education educators still mandated after the 30th of June? The public health direction that requires that um, will lapse after the 30th of June. Um, and so people working in those sector will, will then be bound by the requirements of their um, workplace. Yeah. And I do have another question It popped up just <laughs> that uh, will there be any changes to social distancing requirements? That, that's a really good question to actually end on because well, I, I probably won't end on it, but it's a really good <laughs> question um, because We've said early on that the way you get COVID and the thing that makes it more likely is the more you mix and the closer you mix. Um, so um, there aren't really any prescriptive um, social distance requirements required by public health uh, at the moment. Jenny will correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there are any prescriptive uh, requirements. Our, that suite of documents that we've referred to a number of times We'll mention social distancing and, and kind of the importance of aiming for, if you like, business practices that, that give people a bit of room, um, avoid unnecessary crowding of people uh, if possible. Um, um, so I think people should understand the principle that if you can keep a little bit of distance between each other in, um, in whatever setting you're in, um, you're going to uh, reduce at least a bit the likelihood that you spread infection from one person to another. Um, and again, a great additional question, uh, ventilation is part of the mix. So, you know, if you can kind of, you can kind of think of, um, you know, people mixing and moving together, the ventilation that dilutes the, the air and reduces the likelihood of the virus spreading from one person to the other, that's the right way to think about it. Um, but it probably will be mostly people thinking about it in a, um, kind of not empirical way, but more in general terms um, to guide their work practices and their safety measures. At, uh, at which pretty much I think answer, there is another question there now, um, which is about should ventilation in workplaces be considered in risk assessments? And, and my take on that is the answer is clearly yes. Um, and businesses can enforce capacity limits. Well, I think first of all, their, their businesses will have capacity, legal capacity limits under occupancy uh, permits uh, determined by council, and um, um, and that will still apply. Um, and um, it's uh, the number of people you have in your space is you know inversely proportional to the risk of COVID, basically. Um, so you know, obviously, when you're doing your risk assessment, then you keep that um, principle in mind um, and I would expect that people would be entitled to say that as part of my place being safe as I can practically make it from a COVID point of view this is how many people I think it's acceptable to have here uh, I'm stepping way into Robin's territory there but <laughs> I'll, I'll have a go at it but, uh, um, and and again the last question until another one pops <laughs> But uh, um, when will the new documents be available? And I should say that we will put those web links um, up on the website, Business Tasmania website, along with this um, actual se um, session as well. So, so that'll be another area that people can go to if they want to access those. I think it's the first day or so of next week, I think is where we're aiming for. Yeah. I think I think we're done. <laughs> But uh, we, we don't have any more questions, so we might we just might leave it there. Um, I really want to thank particularly our expert presenters today. I mean, I, I think that was really insightful. I know I've actually learned quite a bit this afternoon. 
uh, to, and I'm sure that's going to be true of, of most of the participants. So I would like to thank everybody for attending today's session. Um, if people would like some more information or, or if they feel that some of their questions haven't been answered, um, I would encourage everybody to contact Business Tasmania. Um, both their email address and their phone numbers um, should be in the Q&A session at the moment. Uh, to, um, but otherwise, unless anybody has anything they'd like to add, I think we're done. Uh, the link to the video. Thanks, Thank everybody. Very the questions, it's been great to hear the questions, actually. It's very helpful to sort of check what we're up to to hear the <laughs> questions. So thank you. And some very practical advice. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.